Check, check, check. Check. Okay, I seem to hear myself okay. you have seen this right now, so I'm just uh, setting this up, it won't be a moment. So, I haven't had that many questions in yet, so we'll, 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 we'll get to that in a minute, but uh, there's still some other questions that have already been asked and which prompted me to start this. Let's see. Uh, Can I torrent off a work laptop when I own a home network? By uh, Gary16jan in the uh, Reddit subreddit uh, R Piracy. The uh, so question is basically the title. I was given a work laptop and I'm going to be using it at home. If I'm connected to a personal network, is it possible to raise flags by torrenting while using uTorrent and the usual sites somehow? I understand that when I'm connected to the work network and VPN, that no torrent should be run in the background or even have a torrent open. I work in Ireland and torrent laws here are not enforced what I've seen, but it's an American company that I work for. Thanks for any help. Okay, well, the simple answer is no, don't do it. Okay? You can't tell your company that you're using something for it. It, it belongs there to be their property. Uh, doesn't matter generally where you are, most companies don't take lightly to uh, using torrent software on their property. Uh, especially if it's an American company, they may become liable under uh, contributory uh, copyright infringement, possibly. Uh, but generally, they don't like you installing unauthorized apps on work laptops. And torrent clients are a definite no-no when it comes to that. You shouldn't install torrent apps on work laptops. That's just a general rule. You shouldn't in install any apps on a work laptop that you don't absolutely need for your job. Um, that's that's at long the short of it. Sure, that they may be able to tell their, their IT department may have monitoring software. They may have a um, 
like an auditing thing to check what's going on, what activity there is. While you're on your own home network, that's that's one thing. But at the same time, you're still using their hardware, their hard drive, their computer. So they still have, in theory, depending on how their IT department set up, they still have access and control over your uh, laptop. So that's never a good way to go, sir. The answer is no, don't. Okay. Let's see what uh, next question. Uh, Cox Communications, uh, again to our piracy by uh, Big Gamble. My ISP is Cox and I have heard that they treat torrents differently than other ISPs. I was curious if someone could help explain. I only torrent older animes and stuff, so are those dangerous to download and see it? ISP notify me and such. Any answers are appreciated. Okay. Cox is, is different in some ways, but not in others. Uh, the main thing about Cox is that they don't uh, ignore torrents so much. Um, let me... Um, fix something very quick. Uh, for the one person I'll be right back. I'm going to... Uh, apparently my stream health isn't quite uh, as good as it could be. Okay. I'm back. Uh, sorry about that. I had to uh, tweak my video output settings. And that should be a bit better. Is it? Okay, well, okay. We're at Cox Communications. Uh, my SP is Cox, and I've heard they treat torrent different. Uh, I was curious to see if somebody could help explain. I only torrent older animes and stuff, so those dangerous to download and seed. ISPs notifying me and such. Any answers are appreciated. Again, as I was about to explain, yes, they're different in some ways, but not in, in others. Um, The, the 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 trick is that um, ISPs don't actually do the investigating themselves. They they never have. What happens is other companies who are hired by copyright holders come and do um, investigations. They they log on to streams. They're hired to uh, look at and then go and. Uh, monitor and log the, the IPs of, of people on it. Uh, they then send that to the ISPs. Now, Cox is a bit different than others in that it's been a very hardline company in the past uh, for dealing with infringements. Um, so, they have a tendency to uh, to do, uh, lean more heavily on infringements. That said, um, they're not uh, leaning so heavily anymore ever since a recent um, court case where they were they were sued for, for not dealing as heavily uh, as they said they would. So it's more likely that they've been towards dropping the, the case against, uh, against uh, infringers and, and just um, doing what every other ISP now has done, which is just uh, pass on uh, claims. Um, so, it's not, uh, it's not quite as difficult or different as many others, and 
the reality is for any kind of major enforcement proceedings, it's still going to have to go through the enforcement company, uh, who then has to file a lawsuit and, and, and do that. And so I wouldn't worry too much specifically about Cox as, it, as compared to other things, uh, especially as in court cases, increasingly, rights holders are being slapped down by the courts for the uh, lack of evidence in presenting cases. Another one then. Um, over the last couple of years, I've noticed that it seems harder and harder to get hold of obscure music on torrent sites. Someone I spoke to said you can still get stuff you know where to look. Sadly, I don't, and just wondered if you guys had any suggestions. I used to use Audio Galaxy, some P2P program that was a little like Merc. Only well, yeah, Audio Galaxy was, was somewhat. Uh, different to torrents. It certainly wasn't like Merck, which is an IRC program. Um, the truth is, yes, torrents in, in many ways have been declining in recent times. Uh, BitTorrent usage has uh, gone down sort over of its peak of four or five years ago, and the, the reason is uh, streaming sites. Uh, why de deal with BitTorrent sites when you can deal with uh, streaming sites, uh, both legitimate, like Spotify, and to some extent YouTube, as well as um, others. Uh, there are sites, as I said, uh, if you know where to look, there's uh, one specific one called Watt, um, and of course Waffles, both of them formed from the aftermath of the Oink Raid, uh, back in 2007, 2008, um, but the reality is that Smaller files have never done quite so well on, on BitTorrent because of the smaller size, and therefore you need to run more torrents to, to shift the same data, uh, and to share the same amount of data. If you're shift, uh, sharing one album, that's, what, maybe three, 400 megs, and you're going to get through that and get your share ratio and get it, it done and out of the way, and you may get bored, delete it, what have you. And, and so there's that. Um, now, other things are, are not quite so um, clear-cut. Uh, torrent sites have, have, over the years, I mean, BitTorrent has now just celebrated last week its 15th birthday. Um, so it's getting a little old and passe now. People who are using BitTorrent now who weren't even born when it was started. Uh, and then you've got the old hands like me who seem to have been using it half their life, even though it hasn't been anywhere close. Um, people are starting to to move on, try and find streaming sites because uh, obviously you get the you know, uh, the um, having to wait until it's completed. You can start it pretty much straight away, and if you don't like it, you can just stop it. Uh, bandwidth has um, dramatically increased over how it was 15 years ago, so. Th there's that as well. Um, you don't get... The whole point of BitTorrent was that it was designed to make uh, large file data transfers more efficient by utilizing the swarm and using everybody's connection to, to, to the best extent possible. Um, so we have uh, that. Um, and now with many people getting you know, 100 megabit faster connections, streaming is just more viable, and the same with uh, hosting companies. Uh, so, yes, things seem to be becoming rarer over, over time, and so that's, that's one aspect of it. Um, specifically for the files, it's always a... I, I, I'm loath to, to recommend these specific sites, uh, especially the so-called private sites, which are often uh, very controlling in, 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 in ways and, and not uh, as private as um, many people like to think it is. Uh, it's often said that it's the best way to avoid being prosecuted for, for the, or uh, pursued by, by copyright infringement uh, activists and lawyers, but that's not actually the case. Um, Many of the, the, the few crim, criminal prosecutions, certainly in the US, that have happened, all happened to deal with uh, those so-called private sites. 
uh, the URL here is deleted from, from the public site, like the Pirate Bay and the private site, which is Water Waffles, is that the private site uses requires you to be a member to sign up and then uh, assigns you a, a key, uh, like a DRM, like most DRM systems, which you have to then use to access uh, things and tell it your account, and you have access as long as you have that account is held in good standing, uh, as decided by the operators or the moderators. So as soon as somebody breaks, a, you break a rule that uh, the operators or the moderators think they can disable your access. So in many ways, that's exactly like other forms of DRM, which is sort of ironic considering the the, the use of um, BitTorrent to get around uh, DRM distributes free of DRM that most people seem to uh, uh, claim to want and, and enjoy. Um, so it's it's okay. it's an unusual um, thing to to, to, to advocate. And the reality is, as soon as any uh, infringement investigator logs onto that site. Um, he can participate in that form and he can do what he wants. He can go out date just the same as he can for anywhere else. Sure, his account may, may go, but so what? He's, he's got the Adrian came on there to get. And all he has to do is later on uh, wangle his way to get another account. Or even better, get his way to become the staff. And that way he, he has full access to everything he wants. Or buy a staff member. They have lots of money back in them. It's not like it's a they're a fantastically profitable company, but they are backed by large profitable companies with lots of money to throw at the problem. So why not just buy an admin off for the hundred thousand dollars or so and have full access to the database? Quite simple. What's more, you get a lot more uh, data stored with a public tracker or an open tracker, such as the ones uh, most people are associated with the Pirate Bay. You get uh, you get the hash and you get IP addresses and that's all that they generally store. With a private tracker or whatever known uh, activity logging or registration required trackers, you get a lot more because they associate an IP address with an account. They keep tracks of how much data you downloaded, how much data you uploaded, which torrents you uploaded, uh, exactly when you're on it, which IPs you accessed it from. Uh, which exactly which client version you used, all this sort of thing is kept and logged uh, because it, it's required to run the security of the site. Uh, without it, uh, the analysis of these uh, circle balls can't be found and they can't do the thing. So they sell it, they sell it as, a, as a form of security and it's really uh, gold, a gold mine of information for anybody who wants to actually make prosecutions. Uh, in addition, many of the site operators uh, request donations and, and beg for money. Some even shut down the site if they don't get enough money and people have to buy and pay for access. And there's a thing called free, uh, pay to leech where they, people basically buy themselves exemptions from having to, to upload a certain amount. They can just download freely and that's, again, uh, infringement for money and that's a, that, that can be considered a criminal offence. Um, so it's a bad idea to, to see these private sites as, as some kind of um, way to escape uh, prosecution. So there are other options, but I wouldn't personally uh, recommend them um, so much. If you if you want the music, if it's that important to you, definitely buy it. Always buy it if it's that important to you. But otherwise, there's, there's plenty of sites out there to, to sample and to investigate before buying. And, uh, Worst case is always just sites like Gemendo, where you can go and uh, get lots of Creative Commons music that artists put out, play it, sample it, download it, share it. So, uh, I hope that answers that. Um, let's see if we can find any more questions. Right now, it doesn't seem that there are that many, but um, let's uh, start by addressing uh, some of the more 
uh, famous uh, copyright infringement cases. Uh, let's start with Prenda. And if there are any of the the the, uh, the troll busting uh, gang here watching this right now live, uh, say something. Shout out in the in the side in the comments. Yes, JD. Uh, anonymous. All the rest of the please, you know, please shout out. Die troll die. Please shout, shout out to say hey. Uh, there's this thing for the rest of you who don't understand. There's this thing called copyright trolling. Um, it's a it's a system of extorting money using copyright and court system to to gain money from people without uh, or for allegedly violating uh, copyright. Uh, it started off in the UK around nine ten years ago with a game called Dream Pinball, uh, but it's it's since uh, been refined and progressed and uh, has um, evolved somewhat. And apparently the stream has just stopped. Is anyone there? using a different system and a different uh, piece of software compared to what I used for the Brexit uh, one, uh, two weeks ago. I'm using open broadcaster software rather than a, uh, a game streaming software. So I'm manually uh, manually doing the, 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 the settings and they may not have come out quite as well as they should have. Uh, and I'm using a different computer as well. Uh, there's been better lighting and better seating for my, uh, my back. Anyway, uh, copyright trolling. Um, it started off with some um, games. Ah, okay, Glenn Channel says you still get me. Good, good to know. Uh, there's a little bit of a lag between what you say and, and uh, me seeing it, so I'm, I'm, I'll answer anything uh, as quick as I can. But uh, said so copyright trolling started in the UK in 2007 with Dream Pinball, and um, basically they would uh, do as they would normally do and, and file lawsuits, but then they go and they try and get uh, instead of sending out a court case, they'd send out a demand and they'd say, send us so and such amount of money to settle this case or we're going to sue you for lots of money. And the trick is the amount uh, costs the, the cost to defend the lawsuit were, significant, were equal to or greater than the cost of settling the suit. So it was cost effective, therefore, to settle it and admit guilt and therefore pay money and it would get it out of the way and done with. That's, that's the main hook. Um, over time, the fact that the companies avoided suing was a, was a big uh, wake-up call to many judges in the UK and uh, then the main company doing it which was ACS Law run by Andrew Crossley in London uh, suffered a uh, DDoS attack by uh, certain groups of anonymous and when trying to bring up their site again they let an email um, thing slip by and an email archive from their IMAP service and that was a bad thing because they admitted that they were actively avoiding trying to take things to court and that they knew their evidence was, was bad. And yes, the evidence in these cases is bad and it's not that great because it's just logs of people transferring data with an IP address. It doesn't link to any one person, it doesn't link to any one thing. I've got seven devices. The, the IP address for the, for the computer and the camera that's right here is also the same address externally as this tablet and it's the same address as uh, laptops in the other room that I used for the Brexit, my other desktops, and 
the Xbox and everything else all has the same one external IP address. In fact, both myself, my kids, my wife, um, they all have the same external IP address. So there's no one person that they can they can link to in a, in a copyright case, and that's a problem because it's not enough to say that this someone in this house did it. They actually have to say that one person did it and that one person is the one who has to pay and they are the ones who are liable. If it's a 13 year old kid then it's going to be diff treated differently by the courts than if it's my 36 year old self. So then there is a, uh, a problem then. With them not having the evidence they need to actually make a solid court case they then have to try and influence people to settle. And this got to be hugely, hugely profitable. I mean, the guy behind it, Andrew Crossley, was saying he made thousands. He was he was openly boasting about having to go and get out and being able to buy a Ferrari. And so that's when the downfall happened. And it turned out, you know, he didn't have the evidence he, he claimed he did to the to the Chancery Courts and to Chief Master Weingarten to, to make this this uh, claim, this court case. And so it kind of fizzled out in the UK, but it then went to the US. Now, the US is slightly different than the UK. Uh, I know I've lived in both. Uh, in case you couldn't tell, I have a, a British accent, but uh, I've lived in the US for more than a decade now. Um, the US has a simpler in some ways, but more complex in others, uh, legal system. Uh, in the UK, these kinds of court cases all went through the Chancery Court uh, using what's known as a Norwich Pharmacal Order, where they could, where it's a streamlined process for this sort of thing, and ISPs are the only ones who can object. Here in the US, things are dragged out a lot more. I mean, the typical case, if fought, can take three to five years. Um, but people can object at each stage of the way, and, and uh, they're assigned a John Doe, and they're known as John Doe suits, or Jane Doe if it's, a, if it's known to be a female, uh, for this sort of case in the States. And it became somewhat popular with a group called Prenda, and they focused on pornography. And there's a big reason for that. Oh dear, I'm accused of downloading a pinball game. Eh. I'm accused of downloading hardcore pornography. Yeah, it's a whole instance, and this is something, one of the, the first modifications that was started in the in the UK, um, where they were accusing people, um, old people often, of downloading as extreme a copy, uh, pornography as they could, um, army fuckers, things like that, um, often Nazi themes, which is, again, if you're 70, 80 years old, uh, you live through World War Two. You don't want to be associated with that, especially you know, British has a has a big thing against um, the Nazis having remembered World War Two, the Blitz, and so on. Um, so now the more extreme pornography, especially if it's a niche pornography, BDSM or um, you know, Nazi, uh, gay, lesbian, or transsexual. Uh, anything like that in the more, more puritan puritanical uh, US is going to be an even greater likelihood of settlement. So then they have that uh, aspect. And they do the same sort of things. They, they'd go and they'd uh, file a lawsuit and um, they, they'd jump on a, a torrent and they'd but this time they had a new wrinkle. Instead of being contracted by an outside company, they owned the copyrights themselves. And this became uh, one of their major downfalls, in fact. Because under US law, the litigants cannot represent themselves except if they're doing it pro se, which is, you know, by themselves. You can't have a company representing themselves and yet at the same time as the law firm representing the company, if they're the same sort of thing, they've got to admit up front and up cl up, uh, clearly that, you know, the two are the same. And here they didn't, to try and obfuscate it and make it look better. And they hid it through shell companies. Um, what they did was they, they 
get this uh, terrible evidence and the two main lawyers, Paul Hansmeier and, and uh, John Steele, um, got uh, Paul's brother, Peter Hansmeier, to provide a company called 68881 Forensics and they uh, had him as a forensic expert, uh, utterly clueless. Um, to try and, and claim people had it, and all they did was they just jumped on torrents uh, using a leech client, which wouldn't send anything to them, and just monitored uh, a bit torrents and just grabbed pieces from an IP account, from an IP address, and, and said, okay, this IP address got it, that IP address got it, that IP address got it, and then they just filed them as a big, big group, excuse <coughs> me, as a big group for their, um, what's called a John Doe suit, and they'd say, okay, it's AF Holdings, for instance, was on the was on the company. AF Holdings versus Doe's John Doe's one to twenty five hundred seven hundred and six twenty five hundred and thirty six. So they named two thousand five hundred and thirty six different people. Um, these are actual just illustratives, they're not actual case names. But yes, they 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 uh, they claim that, and then they'd say, uh, okay, these are all John Doe people. We want to subpoena the ISP to find out who's behind them. Same sort of thing as a Norwich Pharmacal order, but um, without, the, without the streamlined process that Norwich Pharmacal order was, was designed to give in the UK, because it doesn't have it in US law. And they'd say, uh, it's what's called an ex parte discovery. Uh, they would say, we want to find out who, to, who, to, who these people are so we can um, amend the lawsuit and, and, and sue them properly. And so they, they, the judges would say, oh, okay, and they'd get the um, subpoena sent to the ISPs to get the account name, uh, the account holder who was behind that account in the, uh, at the time, alleged. Uh, so they then take that, but instead of turning around and, and dismissing and uh, amending the lawsuit, they then write to those 2,536 people and say, hey, we've detected, you've downloaded uh, mo World's Most Extreme Porn 1 on this date. Uh, we don't want to sue you, but if you, we will sue you unless you pay $3,000 by a month's time. Otherwise, we're going to sue you and your name's going to be dragged through the mud and it's going to be public knowledge, it's going to be in public documents and release a press release and, and so on. And that's basically extorting people to, to pay up or else we're going to drag your name through the mud. Uh, they have very little evidence, and, and let's be honest, most judges are not exactly the most technically trained of people. Most judges are in their 40s to 50s onwards, and uh, so when they were a teenager, their the computers were the sort of, at best, spec um, Spectrums and Commodore 64 sort of level, and they're really not up to up to date on these sorts of you know modern technologies, the internet, the, the technology things. Then you get really, really old judges and some of these judges are now, you know, sixties, seventies, eighties, nineties. And so they're not uh, they're not gonna see the, the problems with, with what they're doing and, and additionally the older as judges get the more of a conservative mindset people tend to have and uh, the more of the Puritan uh, puritanical mindset. So it, it's a big problem that way. Um, so to sort of settle up or settle up or we'll, we'll drag your name to the mud. And a lot of people did settle up and the companies were, were you know, getting millions of millions of dollars a year from this uh, for a very little outcome, but they weren't actually suing anybody. Uh, they weren't following through the lawsuits because that takes money and that costs time. But one or two people did uh, decide to say, we'll fight back in, in many of those cases. Uh, instead of actually fighting and litigating the lawsuit, they just dropped it and said, whoa, he's, he's fighting back, bye, and so that's what they did. Um, it's not the best of things, and in many of those cases, uh, it just ended up like that, they just cut their losses and ran because they were afraid of being confronted, like most bullies are. Um, one of the cases I was involved with happened here in Georgia, and uh, involved a gas station. Uh, it's uh, Air Holdings versus Patel, and uh, I can remember sitting in that courtroom three years ago and, and uh, him and the judge who was in his 80s, late 80s at that point, he'd been appointed to that uh, 
to that judgeship in 1970 by um, President Nixon. That should tell you roughly how old he is. Um, but in this case, they made this same allegation against this ISP account, so it was a gas station. And the owner of the gas station had some people quit, so he'd been working extra long hours, and it was a, a Wi Fi account provided to the gas station for anybody to use. Um, and when he didn't reply, uh, they went and they got a default judgment, which is, you know, well, they get everything they claim for. Well, as soon as he got notified of that, he, he uh, said, ah, went and found a lawyer, and then the lawyer petitioned the court and said, hey, look, we had these reasons we did not answer the thing, real life piled up, we forgot about it, you know, these things happen. Is we, we really want to fight this case because we don't think it's it's right and true, we, we deny the allegations. And judges are, as a whole tend to, to dislike uh, default judgments because they find it's not really justice. You know, real life can happen to people sometimes. If you've got a good reason and if you, you get in timely, then yes, they'll, they'll set aside a default judgment and reopen the case. Well, all of a sudden at that point, uh, this is, you know, a week after the default judgment, they say, oh, wait, you know, we, they, we had some people fired, I've been working extra double shifts, it just got lost in the paperwork. I'm sorry, Your Honor, can we, can we do it again? Uh, I've, I've hired counsel now, I'm serious, I want to find this. And the judge said, mm -hmm. okay. And then two days later, the, 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 the company friend said, oh, uh, you know what? Never mind the default judgment. You guys sure we were all, I think, we don't want to find it now. And then, uh, yeah, we, we give in. We, we, we're going to drop this case. Well, at that point, because it's been answered and they've said they had a default case, and then all of a sudden, a case they were so eager to get and to win was then dropped, they decided that can't be right. So, um, that's suspicious because if you're so eager to get a default judgment and you think you're going to win on the merits of your case, which is a requirement you're generally supposed to have before you start anything, then why is it that as soon as he wants to reopen it and set aside the default judgment and fight it, you want to drop it? That's suspicious. And in truth, be told, that's how they, they tend to work. But they did that and they uh, opened it, and because they dropped it, and just said, okay, you're going to drop your claims. The other side says, okay, since we've won now, we want to sue for the cost it's taken me to, to hire the lawyer and to, and to fight it. And they said, oh, wait, hang on a second, that's going to cost us more money? Uh, uh, yeah, you should deny that. At that point, it's changed from a copyright suit to one about, was it a valid copyright suit? And therefore, if it was a valid copyright suit and it was, it was dropped and it was a win for the defendants, then they should have to pay the legal fees. And... This is when things start to get interesting because it turns out uh, at this court hearing, it was actually three, month, three years ago yesterday, uh, last week, rather than my first time sitting in a federal courthouse, uh, this sort of case, I was uh, somewhat nervous. Um, but it turned out uh, the judge gave us discovery for, I'll say us, they gave the defendants, um, the lawyer I was working with, Blake Chintilla, Chintilla Law in Atlanta, um, gave them discovery, uh, 60 days of discovery, to find out what they could about this company and why they were suddenly uh, against investigating things. And it turns out when you investigate the company's things that they were the ones seeding and uploading the, the torrent files they were prosecuting people over. Um, and that they had absolutely no intention of ever actually taking a case to court because then they could get an expert, like me, and rip their people apart uh, on cross-examination, rip their evidence and claims to shreds. Uh, myself and uh, another guy, Delvin Neville, um, really nice guy, I met a good couple of times, we had some uh, good conferences and stuff, I'll have essentially eviscerated there any kind of evidence claims because there is no solid basis for accusation. Every claim has to be against a specific person. Now a lot of what they were claiming was that in a household the adult male must be the one responsible because it's adult male oriented porn. 
doesn't matter if it's a teenage boy, you know, a 15 year old teenage boy is just as likely as a 30 year old adult male to, to look at, at porn, but their evidence and their claims against a specific defendant were, well, we think it's likely that it's going to be this person. For all they know, it could be the lady of the household could have specific fetishes, or it could be a visitor who who stops by every now and then, spends the night, uh, has their, their laptop going at that point. And it's it's been a uh, an amazing uh, thing, especially in court cases in California where they started uh, facing the wrath of a judge who who asked you know specific pointed questions about their conduct and their ability to prosecute their lawsuits and uh, that's when they started to clam up and uh, were referred to the Justice Department, and the FBI and uh, the IRS for possible tax evasion uh, and fraudulent filings uh, and extortion and when it ended up going to the appeals court uh, last summer uh, 91 year old Judge Pregerson said and I quoted that this whole system they set up was a ingenious, uh, crooked, extortionate scheme. Uh, I'm going to drop in the in the uh, in the sidebar in just a moment. I'm going to drop the um, the video from from the court of the judge explaining what it was, how the scheme works, and uh, why it's such a a bad thing for, for everybody. Um, if you'll just excuse me a second while I uh, search in my, my videos to to pull that up. Um, let's see. Um, but that's... There we go. That, that video there is the... Uh, that's youtube.com slash watch uh, question mark v equals uh, m37qqmbu7dc uh, various capitals and stuff it's in the comments but you can watch the seven and a half minutes of how he explains uh, this 91 year old judge who, who at the opening of court that day had, had uh, celebrated the 70th anniversary of, her, of uh, one of the battles he, he participated in in the Japanese theatre of World War II. So he's not exactly a spring chicken, yet he, he, he grasped the, the whole thing perfectly. Um, is there anybody, again, anybody got any questions or anything, please feel free to ask the questions. You know, I'm, I'm happy to answer them live as they go. Um, but... Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk some more. Uh, I have no problem with talking. I, I like to do that. And uh, let's see what we can. Well, if here's nobody's really got any questions. Well, that's unusual. Good in a possible way. Um, so, another thing that comes up a lot when people ask about safety is how can I avoid being being monitored? Um, in order to avoid being monitored, uh, you have to know how you're being monitored. Uh, the typical way for, for monitoring is to um, is to go ahead and. Uh, join a swarm and that means you get to watch the people taking part but if you start participating in the swarm by seeding out by sending bits out then you can possibly be um giving de facto authorization for the infringement um so most clients don't share that said just because a client isn't sending data to you doesn't mean it's it's a monitoring bot. Uh, a lot of clients download from can download from 50 and are set to only upload to three or four at a time. It may be that you're not uh, one of the people that it's set to share to. You've got nothing. It's got nothing to, to send to you that you want. Um, so that's not always uh, a good reason. It may be that it doesn't like you. It 
feels it's throttling you. It, there's many different reasons why something that looks like it may not be sending to you is not actually a, a bot. Um, now, to get to the, the things, there's two main ways often um, given as to, as to how to avoid getting a notice. Well, there's three main ways, actually. The first is not to be on one that's monitored to start with. Ones that are generally monitored, monitoring is not cheap. Let's just clear it that. Monitoring is not cheap. So it's only uh, ones where people feel there's a need to monitor. Uh, new movies, anything that's, that's come out ahead of its release date, any uh, pre-release or leaked stuff generally gets monitored. Um, because that can, in certain countries, be a uh, criminal matter. Um, if then there's uh, hot new movies that have just come out, uh, especially those that have just come out at the cinema, so uh, expect in a week, you know, Ghostbusters in a few weeks, or Star Trek in a week or two, um, movies like that to, to have their cam versions monitored. Um, and the same when their DVDs come out. Uh, hot new music albums. If they have a, a brand new album out by many major artists, be Kanye, you know, Beyonce, any groups like that, they will, may well tend to be monitored as well, especially if there's been a heavy promotion around it. Um, TV shows, things like Game of Thrones, um, big shows. Big TV shows tend to have spent tend to want to spend the money to get the the, the uh, infringement groups um, monitoring them just because it can be um, a way to to make a little bit of extra money and to to protect the uh, show. So if you avoid those sorts of things, if you avoid the hot new stuff, uh, the new games, the new movies, the new TV shows, the new music, and wait a couple of weeks. That's often the biggest uh, way to go. And of course, pornography. Certain companies are notorious for monitoring. Uh, XArt in particular are filed more, laws, more copyright lawsuits than any other group in, in the US. Uh, something like 20%, maybe 30% of all copyright lawsuits in the US uh, the last couple of years have been done by XArt and Malibu Media. Um, so that's, that's another big thing. If you avoid those sorts of things, the likelihood of being monitored is, is significantly less. Um, one of the other things people tend to use is something called a VPN. Uh, VPN is an encrypted connection. Um, it is a, it takes, well, your, your connection right now goes from your house to your, to your internet provider, and then out that from there it goes into the, into the massive web. Uh, our VPN works differently. It's a, it's a connection between you and a computer and somewhere else. And all your communications go through that, and are sent down it to the um, to that far computer, and then from there it acts as though it, it just emerges into the internet in that place. So if you get a, an, uh, a VPN in say Sweden, as far as anybody's able to tell, your external IP address is somewhere in Sweden, which makes it therefore very hard to to find a lawsuit against you, especially if. Uh, and many VPNs do this, they, they have a no-log policy where they don't uh, contain logs of who was using which external IP address at, at any one time. Which makes it very hard to, to find any kind of lawsuit against you or, or make any kind of copyright claim because they can just say, we don't know who it was, uh, we'll, we'll bear it in mind. And in many countries, that the law says they don't have to make those kind of logs. And they don't have to record who's, who's been um, recording that. Um, the third method is one that's often touted by, let's just say, the creatively ignorant. Uh, it's a system called Peer Block. It used to be called Peer Guardian. Uh, what it is, it's a VPN. It's a IP addresses that uh, are compiled and, and sent and says that these are people who log. And it's this program stops you and, and uh, routes any connections made to or from that IP address straight into. Uh, in, into a wasteland, into, into the bin. Uh, so you don't make any connections to those, so you're event effectively invisible to those IP addresses. One problem with that, nobody knows who the IP addresses used by these companies are. 
Brenda, we found out through our investigation by subpoenaing their records and their, their data that they used uh, the same VPNs that are, I just I just talked about. They use those to, to monitor and to, to put out so that there's no way to track them to any one specific person and they look no different to anybody else. As I said to start with as well, people tend to look for ones that look like they're behaving in an, uh, an odd way, but the reality is with BitTorrent not knowing what every peer is doing on a swarm, you can't tell if somebody's acting in an odd way just to you or to everybody in the swarm. Uh, somebody acting odd just to you is just somebody acting odd to you. Somebody acting odd to the whole swarm is someone who's possibly a logging bot. Um, people like, they also like to throw in company uh, web spaces. Um, quite a famous case a few years back where um, Peer Guardian actually blocked all the update servers for the Nord32 antivirus company. Um, they claimed uh, that one of their admins had been torrenting a movie and saw somebody uh, on a movie torrent from the one of the, the uh, Nord32 uh, update servers. So they blocked all of these sets, uh, commercial ranges. Unfortunately, that then meant that people's antivirus products wouldn't update while they were in it because it was blocking it, all connections to and from the update server. Um, he said the company could be behind Not32 then, then flagged uh, Peer Guardian as potentially unwanted software um, because it was interfering with their update service just like any kind of virus distributor would. Uh, the easiest way to, to stop a virus uh, software from, from updating to detect your viruses to stop them from being able to, to get an update to detect you. Uh, Peer Guardian then went nuts. Um, and the people behind the list, uh, Blue Tack, Internet Security Solutions, or, or uh, um, Blue Tack, as it's coming in our base, uh, went nuts and said, "You shouldn't be doing that. We're legitimate." Just great, except nobody actually knows who they are. Um, they went to great lengths to avoid uh, letting anybody know who they are, and to therefore check out their legitimate. The legit legitimateness. Um, so, that's the thing, and you could ex always exempt it, the thing, exactly what they've told everybody else they could do using their block lists. Um, the reality is, those block lists have never managed to do a, a thing. Um, they've actually listed me in a couple of times because I've, I've criticised their things they often use to. Um, to block out their critics to make the people who use their software seem. Uh, like, they're doing the right thing, because if you can't see any criticism, you can't know any better. Um, it's the same technique used by people in Scientology and other cults by excluding any critical thought. So, uh, I think unfortunately that's about all the time we've got for this right now, and I wish there would be more questions.